that he gets us campaign has produced television videos that highlight an aspect of Jesus' humanity so we can know as we think about Jesus that he gets us with respect to anger and compassion, different things. This morning, a brief video on anxiety. The word translated anxiety literally means a divided mind. It comes from two Greek words, one word for divided and the second word for mind. And so when we think of anxiety, we think about divided thoughts, thoughts and desires that pull in different direction. We see this evidenced in the story of Mary and Martha. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were good friends of Jesus. They lived in a city just right outside of Jerusalem. And every time Jesus went to visit Jerusalem, he stopped by and to visit with these friends. Martha was, it says, distracted by all her preparations. To be distracted means to be drawn away into different directions. She is drawn away by different cares and responsibility. She wants to do this and she wants to do that. She had lots to do though in order to serve those who would be attending and she couldn't sit at Jesus' feet. And Jesus speaks to her and says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, you're worried and upset. Worry means is the word translated anxiety. It means experiencing a divided mind. Martha was drawn in two different directions at the same time. Part of her wanted to be in the kitchen preparing the meal. Another part of her wanted to be sitting at Jesus' feet alongside Mary. And both of these parts reflected things that she wanted inside of her, but her desires didn't align. If she gave in to sitting at Jesus' feet, then she would frustrate the part of her that wanted to be cooking the meal. If she cooked the meal, then she would be frustrated. The, the part of her that wanted to be sitting at Jesus' feet would have been frustrated. Um, upset. He says, not only you are worried, but upset. To be upset is the word to describe a riot. When a lot of people are shouting and angry, that's the word for upset. So when we think about what Martha is experiencing, she wants to do different things and her head is really loud. And if she, if we could hear the thoughts in her mind, we might hear something like this. Women aren't supposed to sit at the feet of rabbis. And then the other part of said, just make dinner. Just don't make such a fuss. Well, Mary should be helping. And why doesn't Jesus tell her to help me? Her head was really loud. And so she discharges her tension. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? A little snarkiness there. Um, making Jesus know that she really didn't like the fact that he didn't uh, stand up for her. Jesus doesn't tell her what she wants to hear, though. He says, Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken away from her. Jesus isn't dismissing the need for food. But as we think about when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, there was the opportunity to turn this stone into bread and prioritize meeting your physical needs. And at that time, Jesus says, no, my father said he'd take care of me. So I'm going to trust him to provide for me in his time. Jesus learned to do that, and he learned to put the Father's needs before his own. He's establishing priorities, but, but he did understand 
what was happening inside Martha's mind. And he lets her know that. He, he lets her know, I know you're distracted, drawn away. I know you're worried. You have a divided mind. I know that you're upset. It's loud in your mind. And Jesus understood Martha because he understood anxiety. Now, he might not have experienced the same kind of anxiety that Martha experienced or that we experienced, but Jesus did experience what it feels like to have his thoughts going in different directions. Jesus sympathizes with anxiety, even though he was divine, he was also human, and he understands what anxiety feels like. At one point, Jesus was told that there were Grecian Jews who wanted to see him. And when Jesus hears that, he automatically understands, okay, the time has come, because what he understands is that his role is to open up a relationship with God, not just to Jews, but to the whole world. But in order to do that, he's going to experience difficulty and he's going to have to die. What he says is, now my heart is troubled. The word for troubled is the word to describe if you've ever seen a storm at sea. And the waves are being tossed, and if you think about that, and that's what his heart is like. Or it used to be with washing machines, you know, it had the front thing, and I remember we had a washing machine that you could open the door when the machine was going. You can't do that anymore because it's protected. <laughs> but um, but it used to be that you could and you could you could see the machine, the agitator going, and that's what Jesus felt like inside, agitated. The the surfacing of difficult emotions. And he says, now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He didn't ask the Father to save him from this hour of agitation. It wasn't just the hour of his death, but it was experiencing that. And the reason why he didn't want the Father to save him from that, because that's why he was sent. Jesus was sent so that we might understand that he understands us. That, not, that the Father sent him to be embodied so that he could experience the kind of splitness that we experience. Jesus experienced anxious thoughts, turbulent emotions, a divided mind. He learned to deal with, with anxiety during his life. There's a passage we're going to read, and as far as I know, it's the only passage I'm aware of where it says Jesus learned something. Now, Jesus came, and he was divine, but he was human. So, having come, Jesus existed with God as a spirit being, but entered a body, and so when Jesus became embodied, there was something he had to learn. Look what it says. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears. It's not just talking about the end of his life, I don't think. It's talking about something that Jesus learned during his life. He learned to experience difficult emotions, pain and grief, things that are difficult to experience. And what he learned as well, he learned the word obedience. But listen to what obedience means. It comes from two Greek words, under and listen. Obedience literally means Jesus learned under listening. You know what it's like when anxiety hits and you have a loud head. It's hard to listen to anything other than the noise and the desires inside. What Jesus learned to do, even when his thoughts and feelings were loud, he learned to tune the Father in, to listen to what the Father is saying, and to speak to him because he listened. Now, Jesus had to learn that. It's not something that comes naturally. And if Jesus needed to learn it, would you agree? We need to learn it as well. It doesn't come 
developed in us, what will happen then? We will experience anxiety, and it will not be natural to talk to God about what we're struggling with. It will be natural to try not to struggle, to pretend we don't want something, or it will be natural to be angry and to blame somebody else. It will be natural to blame self or others. It will not be natural to learn to touch our frustrated feelings and to touch God's hand at the same time. This has to be learned. And when it's learned, it's not learned in a context where everything is going well. The only way we learn to do this is by experiencing anxieties. Jesus didn't rely on changing his desires or his, the, the decisions of other people. It says, although he was a son, in the latter part, he learned obedience. And that's that word under listening from what he suffered. Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. It says, although he was a son, Jesus didn't need to experience anxiety to be a son. He didn't need to experience anything to be more loved by the Father. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he experienced. But once made perfect, and that doesn't mean morally, but he came to be a representative in order for Jesus to be able to enable us and help us. He needed to understand what it was like. That's why he says he became a source of eternal salvation. So for Jesus, he didn't need to learn obedience and to learn to tune in the Father to be a son. He did need to learn to tune in the Father to be a source. And if we want to channel spiritual influence into and through us, Apparently, it will require us learning what Jesus learned, a very difficult thing. It's to be aware of our anxieties and to create an ability to talk to him about them, not to fix them, not to blame them, but to learn to talk. And this will not be something that will be easy. Jesus had to learn it over time. If he had to learn it, so will we. It won't be something that will come naturally, um, we are to pour out our anxieties on him. Look what it says. Paul writes, don't be anxious about anything. I'm glad it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't say don't worry. It's impossible not to worry. And here's what it says to do about it. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. What it's going to tell us to do is to present. And when we present, think of who you're presenting to. Sometimes we're very conscious of what we're saying, but we kind of vent out loud when we pray. And it's not saying vent out loud. Think about who you're talking to. You're talking to God. Be honest, but think about who you're talking to. And when you bring your request with thanksgiving, um, what it says is that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say when you present your request to him that he'll give you what you ask. It doesn't say that. Now, sometimes that will happen, but that can't be. It doesn't happen all the time. So that's not where our confidence is. If you bring your request to God, it doesn't say that he's going to give you what you want. What it does say, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it trumps understanding. It will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And what it's saying is that it's when you think of peace, peace is not a feeling here. It's like UN peacekeeping forces. And UN peacekeeping forces, when they go and are dispatched to a place of trouble in the, in the world, they don't go and hand out flowers. They, they are armed. And what they do, they create a protective perimeter around the people that they are seeking to protect. And that's the image that we get from the peace of God guards our hearts and minds. And what happens then as we learn to present our requests, what will happen? We will more and more experience not a feeling of peace, but we will develop a confidence that even though our desires are frustrated, that God is with us and that he's walking with us. And that will give us progressively, not quickly, 
little by little, will start to be less alone in our anxieties. That's the hard thing about anxiety, how isolated it makes us feel. Nobody understands what I feel like. She doesn't understand. He doesn't understand. They don't understand. Jesus understands. He experienced divided thoughts. He experienced them so that we could know he understands us. So that when we walk through anxious days, that we can have a basis to believe that Jesus walks with us and he's not frustrated with our anxiety. What he would say to you in your anxiety, maybe he doesn't know precisely, you, he doesn't have your circumstances, but your desires are split. You want this and that and you can't reckon. What Jesus would say to you, I understand exactly what that's like. I know exactly what it's like because I came in order to experience it. And he, he tells us to present our request to the Father just like he learned to do. That doesn't come naturally. Um, it's what Jesus had to learn. He entered a human body in order to accept human desires. Before he came, now Jesus existed before he came to the world, but he didn't live in a body. He didn't understand what it was like to live in a body. Angels don't live in bodies. Jesus came to live in a body. What he came to do, he came to live in a body so that he could experience human and immortal desires at the same time. And to honor both of them, to communicate both of them to the Father. Um, this is what Jesus did the night before he died. He tuned in the different desires that were in him. But it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus experienced two thoughts. And he didn't dismiss either one of them. On the one hand, he said, let this cup pass from me. Ostensibly, I don't want to die. He was experiencing the anxiety that comes from his understanding of what was going to happen. And what he does, he experiences, I don't want to die. Not only does he experience it, this is the thing that's amazing to me. He doesn't try to fix it. He doesn't in his mind, say, I'm the son of God. I can't feel something like this. I have to die in a day. He holds it and he expresses it to his father. Take this cup from me. And yet he experiences something else. Yet I want to go through what you want me to go through with. So thy will be done. He didn't try to fix it. And these feelings went in different directions. And you know what he did? He didn't throw a penalty flag at, each, at either one of them. He felt different things, and he talked to his father about them. Why could he do that? That's what he learned. He learned obedience, under listening from what he suffered. During his life, he learned to experience difficult things and talk to his father about them so that when a really difficult thing came, at the end of his life, he had developed expression muscles that he could take feelings and express them to his father. He developed that ability because he worked at it. If there's something to work at, to touch and be aware of your anxiety, don't try to fix it, and to touch God's hand at the same time. To learn not to dismiss the things you're worried about, hold them, but don't throw them at somebody. Hold his hand as well and talk to him about them. That's what Jesus learned. And it's a difficult thing to learn because look what happened. This account, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. What do you think is going to happen after the angel comes and strengthens Jesus? I think it probably his tension will 
be relieved and it will go away. That's what we tend to think, that when God strengthens him, he's going to feel better. But look what it says in the passage. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. We don't know that he, if he literally sweat drops of blood, he might have, but it might just be a metaphor. At any rate, he was sweating profusely because of what he was going through. Here's the interesting thing. The angel strengthened him, and then he grieved. It's not that he grieved, and then the angel strengthened him and said, there, there, Jesus, don't do that. When he was strengthened, he cried out to the Father. Isn't that interesting? You know what strength would mean? In our experience with anxiety, what divine strength would mean? Not that we push our anxious thoughts away. What God's strength will do is enable us to actually come into God's presence and talk to him about that's what divine strength would do. That's what it did with Jesus. And in that anxiety, Jesus experienced the strength to walk through the next 24 hours and the difficulties. There's something that this is something that we that we have to learn. Again, Jesus had to learn it to experience bodily, mortal, and immortal desires, and not to dismiss either one of them, but to experience them and talk to our Father about Him. Because you know what the deal is? He cares about what you're going through. He cared enough to send Jesus to experience anxiety so that we could know that God gets it in His Son. Um, Martha seems to have learned something, it seems. When the last time when she had that thing and she got snarky with Jesus, that was about a year and a half into Jesus' ministry, about uh, maybe toward the end of his life, there's a similar situation. Look what happens. Um, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived whom Jesus had raised from the dead. This is right toward the end, right, right close to the end of his life, about a week before. Uh, look what happened here. A dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. The same thing is happening. Martha is serving. Mary is at Jesus' feet. And what do you notice about Martha? She's not grumbling. She probably had a gift for service. And yet what happened, because she had expressed herself to Jesus earlier in their relationship, apparently she learned something. Because here she's serving again. But she's not going frism, rism, frism, rism. You know, Mary should get here with me. She, she has adopted her role. I wonder why. What do you think? Why was she able to be more content? Why didn't she react as she had reacted a year and a half before? Might it be? She didn't feel as alone. She had learned to verbalize some of her thoughts to God. And having verbalized her thoughts, she was a little less snarky, a little less caustic, a little less critical. It would seem when we go through something difficult and we practice involving God in what we're going through, it allows us to be a little bit less reactive with others, a little bit gentler. The reason why we react to others is they make us feel things that we think we need to control and we resent them for it. Why did you do this? Now I have to deal with this feeling, and I can't deal with this feeling. Why did you do that to me? And it's like we don't have any option, but what God wants to teach us, to feel what we feel, it's not pleasant to feel difficult feelings, but it's better when you don't have to feel them alone. That's what the Bible seems to suggest I'm going to close with this. Paul writes, we taught, we saw this passage. We're going to go on through it and, and make, um, give you three words. 
terms of dealing with anxiety, present, ponder, repeat. Dealing with anxiety, present, ponder, repeat. Present. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Do not be anxious about any, anything but in everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Present your requests. When there's things that you want, touch them and communicate them. Present them. That's step one. Look where it goes right after this. Step two is ponder, think. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything or is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. When you think about what you, you have and don't want or want and don't have, think about it and present your requests to the Father. Learn to do that. That's just step one. Step two, ponder. Think about what God is doing that is excellent or praiseworthy or admirable or perfect. Present, ponder, and third, it says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. What that seems to be saying is repeat. Present, ponder, repeat. Some of us are good at presenting, not at pondering. We're good at telling God what we want, but we don't stop to think about what God's doing in our life, the good things he's doing. So some of us are good at presenting and not at pondering. Some of us are really good at pondering, but not presenting. When we feel upset, we automatically think about, well, I need to think about the positive things in my life. And, but that, over, that, that, that overlooks presenting. And try not to overlook either one of them. Present. Let God know what you are dealing with, what you're feeling. That's what Jesus did. Ponder. Think about the things that God is doing. Repeat. Present. I'll give you a second. Think about your life. In what place do you not have what you want to have? You have what you don't want to have. Is it work? Is it home? Is it health? Is it friends? You have what you don't want, or what you want what you don't have. There's things that you want, but he says, present. Tell God about it. God, you know what? I'd like to have, I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give you a bunch of time. Tell him about that. He wants you to tell him, and it won't be that your tension will disappear. Telling him doesn't eliminate your attention and enables you to endure it, because he doesn't want you to deal with the tension alone. Present. Now, I want you to think about it. Think about that thing you don't have. Whatever is Honorable, true, right, pure. Can you think of anything that God has done in your life because of some of the things you're dealing with? Think about what he's done, the good things he's done. Sometimes the only way we can learn to do something is to struggle. Somebody said, God's address is at the end of your rope. You learn anything about him? Learn anything? Ponder the things that God has done in your life. Go ahead, think about that. <laughs> Tell him about it. God thanks that you are doing X or Y.
present, ponder, repeat. Let's stand for closing prayer. And uh, there's some great soups back there. So, um, well, hopefully the individual serving, I, I know that I'm going to be a wise guy. Hopefully they're not cursing. Why don't they get in there and help? Let us help. So why aren't they helping? So when you go in, make, make sure to tell them, thanks for serving. God, thanks for um, sending your son so that we could understand that he understands, that he gets us. Although he was divine, he experienced things that we experience, human things. He came to experience those things. That's why you sent him, not only to die, but to experience what we experience. So that we would know that you understand and that it would help us to come to you and present. Ponder the things that you're doing in the midst of it and, and that we would develop an ability little by little to learn what Jesus learned. Under listening, tuning you in, listening and talking to you. It doesn't happen fast. Little by little in difficulties, but thanks for um, Jesus' model and his example. In Jesus' name. Amen. Again, hope you can stay. Some great soups. And if you can't, be safe out there. But let's go back there. And, and let me pray for the food. Otherwise, it'll be cursed. And then we'll get sick when we eat it. So, <laughs> God, we do thank you for the food. And thanks for the chance we have to eat it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now you're safe. No, it's, now it's okay. <laughs>